Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Uh, Wow, that is... um... It's just beautiful. It's That's how just it's supposed beautiful. to feel. That's how it's supposed to be. Thank you, Jesus. It's just beautiful. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We need so much more of the Holy Spirit. So much more of the Holy Spirit. Like a mighty rushing wind. Pour it out again. That. Mm. Father, pour your spirit out again on this room. Descend even more on this room. We already know that you're here. You've been here all morning. I pray, Lord, just fill this room. Permeate every inch with your power. Fill us up, God, where we can't contain it. To where we can't contain it. Don't be afraid of silence. Don't be afraid of silence. I know some of y'all probably think I don't know what to say or that it's really awkward. There's those moments where he's a mighty rushing wind and there's those moments where he's a still small voice. And he's speaking to somebody today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Take over. Take over. Pour it out. We could sit here all day like this. (laughs) Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Pentecost. For Resurrection Sunday and everything in between. Come and fill this room, God. Come and fill each of our hearts, Lord, like tongues of fire. Pour your spirit out again. Amen, amen, amen. I don't want to uh, ruin the moment. But uh, I am extremely excited and honored that you gave me today to preach. Uh, He told me a few weeks ago or a month or two ago, whenever it was, if I would uh, be able to preach today. And I said yes without thinking. Uh, And then when I looked at the calendar and I saw it was Pentecost, I was like, yeah, definitely. I will uh, will definitely take that. So uh, I believe God has an amazing word that he gave me today to give to you. Uh, I've been hearing a lot lately on the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think God is ready for another outpouring, another outpouring, um, another great revival, another great revival. And uh, I don't know if we're ready for it, but we better get ready for it. (laughs) Because, you know, We always say we want more of this and more of that, and uh, more blessings also comes with more burdens. The higher the levels, the bigger the devils, and the more. The size of the attack is always equivalent to the size of the anointing over your life. And this morning, you guys can wander off whenever you're ready. This morning, uh, whoo. It's good. If anybody was here for team meeting, you've already heard like half of the sermon. So, and then at the beginning of praise and worship, uh, but real quick, not real quick, we're going to take our time. If you have somewhere greater to be, let me know because there is no greater place to be than in his presence. It is... It is moving today. He is moving today. The spirit is moving today. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pray one more time. Lord, fill us up. I'm just a vessel. Speak through me and strike the hearts of those who need it, God. It is the Holy Spirit that works in us and through us. And we want nothing more than all of you. I want nothing more than all of you. And I thank you for everything that you're doing, Jesus. In your name, everybody said, amen. amen. Since you're already standing, uh, you can bring the lights up, Kelsey. Thank you. Can we give uh, a, a wonderful round of applause to the praise and worship team? You guys did amazing today. We're a little short today. If you can, just remain standing for one second. I know your, your feet are tired from, from running through my mind all week. But uh, I believe God has an exciting word, an exciting word. And uh, I also I want to say thank you to the production team. I don't ever uh, give enough to them. They are behind the scenes, and they make all of this happen. Make all of it happen. You guys don't even know what they're doing until it messes up, and then you're like, whoa. <laughs> but it's never their fault. It's always technology, and they are, they are wonderful uh, servants and volunteers, everything. None of this happens without all of you who volunteer, so I want to say thank you. And with that, welcome to Family Church on this Pentecost Sunday. Uh, I'm going to start in Acts chapter 1, and uh, just uh, eight, eight quick verses, and then we will, we will jump in to the well of wonder, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, aren't you glad that your name is not Theophilus? I wrote all about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Can you bring me down just a little bit? Sorry, my ears are weird with sound. <clears throat> For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You cannot, you cannot have Pentecost Sunday without sharing a message on the Holy Spirit. So we are jumping into the wonderful story of Pentecost. Today, as, uh, as you find your seats, tell somebody, I need a dose of the ghost. Today's message is dose of the ghost. Dose of the ghost. And obviously not like a ghost, like a haunted house or anything like that. We are talking about the Holy Spirit for you wonderful Pentecostal people that are a little more old school. We say the Holy Ghost. Some people say the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but it is interesting to note that only two of the seven churches in Revelation were scolded for false doctrine. Uh, I know TikTok and Instagram and all these people would have you believing that probably every preacher on the earth right now is a false prophet. But going by what Jesus told us in Revelation, pretty much only two of the seven churches were scolded for false, false doctrine. What was far more common was a lack of spiritual vitality, a lack of fervency, and a lack of closeness to the Lord. So obviously, he wanted to talk about that a lot more. He wanted to focus more on the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the teacher, 
the intercessor, the Holy Spirit. He is not an it. He is a person, a person of the Trinity that unfortunately too often is getting neglected. <clears throat> and we see it uh, far too often now that there is almost a shortage of the Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit empowering us and guiding us, we're never going to be able to spread the gospel of Jesus like it needs to be spread. Never going to be able to do it without the Spirit. There is uh, not so much a lack of knowledge because obviously with the wonderful internet and Google and schools, you can fill your head with all sorts of knowledge. But the problem is we're starting to replace our faith in God with just facts about God. And we're not looking as much into faith as we are just facts. And uh, I read um, in this book recently that it takes more than academic rigor to win the world to Christ. Proclamation and teaching aren't enough. Correct doctrine alone isn't enough. God must be invited to confirm the word with signs following. That's Hebrews 2.4. The gospel must be preached with the involvement of the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. And he goes on to say that maintaining doctrinal purity is obviously good. But it is not the whole picture for the New Testament church. What the apostles wanted to do, much more than simply hold the fort, they asked God to empower them to move out and impact an entire culture. An entire culture. And now when we find them in this story, as we said, and we'll find out in a minute that uh, Jesus was with them for 40 days, and then after he ascended to heaven, that was uh, verse 9. We didn't read that. We only went to 8. But if you read that, um, right after he gives them this command, he ascends to heaven. And so now they're in this season of waiting. And the thing that I could compare it to is, has anybody seen The Walking Dead? I forgot. This church is so holy, they don't do anything except <laughs> praise God all the time. One person has seen The Walking Dead. The biggest show. Oh, oh now. Okay, good. There we go. It's okay to admit it. It's all right. I used to watch it some, and then it was just stupid. Uh, but if you remember, and I'm sure anybody that can watch it, for those of you that haven't watched it, uh, you could watch each episode, and in the first few minutes, something would happen, and you would be like, holy cow, I've got to sit here and see what's going on. This is crazy. What's going to happen with this person? What's going to happen with this person? And then for the next like 45 minutes, you're wondering why on earth you ever watched this show, because it was just complete filler with nothing going on, and the story was just dragging and dragging and dragging. And then right before you're about to turn the TV off, within the last five or 10 minutes, they do it again. And now you're like, well, now I have to watch it again next week because I don't know what's going to happen. And now I have to know. So that's pretty much The Walking Dead for those of you that haven't seen it. And so this is where we find ourselves with the tension in this moment that the disciples have not been filled with the Holy Spirit yet. They have been promised the Holy Spirit, and they have received it because Jesus, as we know, he, he taught them and he guided them while he was here on earth with them, and then he was murdered for our sins, placed in a borrowed tomb, a borrowed tomb, because what do you do with something that you borrow? I can't, what, I'm a little old. You give it back. You're only keeping it for a little bit of time. See, Jesus, they borrowed the tomb because they knew he was getting back up. He knew he was getting back up. You don't, need to, you don't need to purchase the tomb when you know that you're going to be beaten the grave within a couple days. He was going to be raised up because he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. But the disciples at this moment haven't had that yet. So in John 14 is when he first promised them the Holy Spirit. He promises to send an advocate that will help them and be with them forever because he lives in them and will be in them. And then in John 20, verse 22, this is now the first evening after Jesus was resurrected. This is where he fulfills the promise, and he breathes the Holy Spirit on them. See, John 14 was the promise. John 20 was the provision of the Spirit. And he breathes on them, it says in verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And this is how much I love the Bible. So the Greek word for breathed in this verse is the same verb that is used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in Genesis 2, 7, 
where God formed a man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. It is the same verb also used in Ezekiel 37, where God said, prophesy to these bones, breathe on these slain, that they may live. God is telling us that when we receive Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are reborn, we are renewed, we are restored, we are redeemed, we are regenerated. We are no longer bound by sin. We're no longer under the finality of death. It can't sting us anymore. We, when, as soon as we, you don't get eternal life, when you die, you've already got it when you've accepted Jesus. And we've been given the same breath of life that God put into Adam when he first made Adam. And we are made new and we are made alive. We are anointed. We are given authority. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in each and every single one of you if you have Jesus in your life. And so the disciples are reborn in this moment in John 20. And we are reborn when we come to Jesus. But obviously, that is not where the story ends. That is not where our story is supposed to end. But we have too pitifully put a blockage on the power of the Holy Spirit. And we don't focus enough on the Holy Spirit anymore. I've been listening to Billy Graham all week about this stuff. So woo. if it ain't firing you up, I'm fired up. But the church needs to quit stopping the Spirit. So in Acts 1, back to our text, in the former book, the former means something came before this. This is the continuation of the story of Christ. And Luke uh, is the author, and you might know him from other um, New York Times bestsellers known as the Gospel of Luke. He also wrote Acts. They were actually kind of put together. Um, it's a little weird how it's laid out in the Bible because John is between them, but they're pretty much, Luke, or, I'm sorry, Acts picks up where Luke leaves off. So this is kind of like the sequel of the Spirit. And the Gospel of Luke is written to the Gentiles, uh, much more than Jews, because Luke was probably a Gentile. And he provides, obviously, we know the account of Jesus' birth and life and ministry and his death, his resurrection. Together with Acts, it is the longest book of the New Testament. And some more proof that it was for the Gentiles, for us, is in the fact that when he gives Jesus his genealogy, he goes all the way back to Adam. Matthew only went to Abraham because Matthew was for the Jews, because Matthew was a Jew. <clears throat> and Luke stresses the universal scope of the gospel, showing that Jesus came to bring salvation to the entire world, Jews and Gentiles alike, to all of us. This is why we are sitting here today still talking about Jesus when all of this happened thousands of years ago is because of this document. And Luke wrote this, I love it, to provide the account of all that Jesus began to do and teach, began. Jesus' work on the cross was finished, but the good news and all the news about him has yet to spread. Because right now at this point, and I know this is hard to believe for the younger crowd, there was no internet, there was no TikTok, there was no Instagram or Facebook. They didn't have cars or planes. I don't even know if they did like pigeons, like those things on Game of Thrones where you tie like the little, oh, I'm sorry, y'all probably don't watch that either. <clears throat> so how are these people supposed to know about Jesus and all that he has done for them? They're going to need help, right? They're going to need help to spread the spirit, to, to, to spread the message to the ends of the world, because that was Jesus's commands. But they're stuck in this waiting period, and they have an idea of what is coming. They know the promise. They know there's an advocate coming. They know there's a helper coming, but they don't know what that looks like. There's no telling what that is going to look like. They don't even know when it is going to be or where it is going to happen. They just know he's coming, and Jesus told them to wait, and they spent 40 days with Jesus, and now there's even more waiting for an unknown. And they're in Jerusalem, which is literally where Jesus just got killed. So now they're in a place that they're, they're supposed to wait in a place where our Savior just died and rose again, and there's all this contention, and the people hate them, and they're making up lies about them, and they're supposed to wait there with all these people that hate Jesus and hate his followers. They've got to wait there kind of like how you're waiting in your own season with people that might hate you literally just because you come to church or hate you because you come to this church, the, 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 the co cocaine church, as we're known on Facebook now. That is an inside joke for those of you who haven't seen that or heard that message. But they've got to wait here in a place that has people that hate them. 
waiting in a dark place. Maybe you're waiting in a dark place. Maybe you're waiting in a place surrounded by enemies. And you know that God has a purpose for you. And you know that God has a plan for you. And you know that God has a promise for you, but you don't know when it's going to come to pass. You don't know where it's going to come to pass. And I would say you don't know what it's going to look like, but you've already made up an idea in your head of what it's going to look like. And I can promise you right now, it's not going to look like the uh, story that you've got going up in your head. It's going to look completely different. He will put you in a mess or he will allow, allow you to go through a mess to get the message across. You're praying for more patience and God is sending you crying babies in the back as a distraction. I'm just teasing. Don't, <laughs> don't take them out. Uh, <laughs> but you're, you're stuck in a season of waiting. You're stuck in a time of waiting. And while it's easy to give up because you're not sure what to do next, you know that God has called you to wait. And it is so easy in the waiting to compromise your values, to compromise your character because nothing appears to be changing at all. And now Jesus has left them alone and he has ascended to heaven. They no longer physically have Jesus for them. And all he said was, wait in this crazy place for a gift. It's coming in a few days. If you've seen the chosen soon, it's, it's going to be soon. And you have no idea what soon means. Soon, you think, means like five minutes ago. And Jesus is like, eh, it might be five years from now. It might be longer than what you are thinking about. And he says, wait for the gift. You're about to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And this is how crazy we are as a people. They, they gather around him and, and they still don't get it. Like, oh, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now at this time? Like, it, you, I imagine Jesus at some point was like, do you guys, <laughs> like just a face palm, like, I've told you so many times, please stop. <laughs> They still don't get it. They thought he was coming for something different. And he's telling them, I'm not here to restore that kingdom. I'm not here to restore an earthly kingdom because that system is already broken. I'm here to restore humanity. I am here to restore what it always should have been, the original design, the original intention. I am here to cast a light on the darkness. I am here to cast demons out in my name. I am here to cast sickness out and disease, to beat death, to beat hell and the grave, to abolish anxiety, to demolish your depression. And he is not here for something that will pass away. He is here to make all things new. He is here to change the world. And they are waiting for the gifts. And the ghost is the gift. And up until Pentecost, if you know your Bible, the Holy Spirit pretty much only worked on a few individuals at a time. All throughout the Old Testament, we see how he would indwell people for a time to use them for a purpose. We see how he clothed Gideon in the spirit and, and, and empowered Gideon to where he could fight an army. Uh, what was it? 135,000 with 300 people. We see how the Holy Spirit, because of Saul, who was uh, doing crazy stuff, the Spirit leaves Saul, goes on David, and the next chapter is when David beats Goliath. The next chapter is when David beats Goliath because he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. We see that John the Baptist was clothed in the Spirit, had the Spirit poured out on him while he was still in the womb. And they thought that he was Elijah because he was like Elijah returned to prepare the way for the coming of Christ, to prepare the way for the Lord. And we even see before Jesus begins his ministry on earth, we sang about it 20 minutes ago that the dove, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came down and descended on him. Jesus was clothed in the spirit before he even began his ministry. Moses prayed for the day that all believers would be filled with the spirit. He prayed for the day that we could all have access to this instead of just one or two individuals at a time. That we would all have access to the, to, the, to the Holy Spirit, to the power of the Spirit. And that prayer turns into a prophecy in Joel, in Joel 2, 28, where he says the Spirit will be poured out on all people. There is so much of the Holy Spirit that we have to return to, that we need to focus on, that we need to talk about. 
Billy Graham, as I was talking about listening to him, he pointed out that we cannot walk out our Christian faith, our Christian lifestyle alone. We have to have the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we fail because of our flesh. So it is the Spirit that fills us to give us life. The Spirit fills us to work through us, to work in us, in order to work through us, to work on us. And the Spirit comes to sustain us, to keep us focused on Jesus every day, to focus on our Bible every day, to focus on God every day, to pick up our cross every day and die to ourselves, to follow Jesus. You cannot do it alone. I can't do it alone. We have to have the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit that leads us to do the work and the will of God in this life. It is the Spirit that compels us to tell other people about Jesus. You can't do it alone. And that is why you are not alone. You're not alone. It is the Spirit that came on you when you accepted Jesus as your Savior Savior, that strengthens you and guides you. It is the Spirit that will fill your mouth with the words to tell others about Jesus when you don't know what to say. He will speak through you. You are just the vessel. But you can, you can stop him. You can stop him. When you get that inkling and you feel that pull trying to tell somebody something or love on them, show them grace, buy them a cheeseburger, a homeless guy on the side of the street, you can stop that tug and it hardens your heart. And that makes it harder to come to Jesus. That makes it harder to listen to the Holy Spirit. And when you come to Jesus, when you come to Jesus and follow him, the spirit is the seal of your salvation. You receive the Holy Spirit, but Jesus desires so much more than that. And this is why Luke is telling us that in the last book, that was just the beginning of what Jesus did. He tells us that Jesus physically leaving the disciples is only the beginning of things to come. We know that Jesus obviously is not physically here, but he is always with us because of the spirit that lives in us. So what are we supposed to do? I mean, look at verse eight. You will be my witnesses, my witnesses in Jerusalem. Church, we are not called to stay silent. We are called to spread the gospel. We are called to spread the message of Christ. And when they want you to shut up because they think that you're judging them or that you're being hateful and that you're a bigot, being hateful is when you're not talking to them because you know what is awaiting them. If they do not give their life to Christ, you already know what awaits them because it was awaiting you at one point in your time as well, uh, uh, one point in your life as well. So that's, that is the love of Christ, is telling people about him. We're not supposed to stay silent. We're supposed to share the good news of his life, of his death, and of his resurrection, of his ultimate defeat of death, hell, and the grave, to tell the world of his redemption for us, for them, for you. You will be my witnesses. I want you to tell people about me. This is Jesus. I want you to tell people about me. I want you to do greater works than I did while I was here. I want you to do more than I did while I was here. I want you to cast out demons in my name. I want you to heal people in my name. I want you to tell people about me so that they can receive life and life abundantly. We know, we already know that Jesus told us to go forth and make disciples. We can't do that sitting in a church pew. And here he is telling them, don't stop. Don't stop until this reaches the ends of the world. Now, remember, they don't have internet. They might have like smoke signals or something, you know, but they don't have cars or buses. They got some horses. Kelsey would have loved it. (sighs) How (laughs) are they going to accomplish this? How are they going to accomplish this? What are they supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? How are we going to accomplish this? How are we going to reach the lost at the ends of the world? The first part of verse eight, you will receive power, power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is the whole point, the power of the Holy Spirit. This is supernatural power. You can't do it. They can't do it without the Holy Spirit. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit. We need his power. We need a dose of the ghost. Yeah, a dose of the ghost. You need to take your medicine and be filled. I love this. The the root word in Greek for for power is dunamis. 
dunamis. This is where we get the word dynamite from, which means this is explosive power. This is unimaginable power. This is unthinkable power. This is unfathomable power. This is something you are not going to be able to wrap your tiny little mind around because we can't understand the infinite power and grace and love and mercy of our God, of the Holy Spirit. This is a massive power with a massive purpose to spread the message about Jesus because Christianity began with Jesus, but it spreads because of the spirit. And whether you want to call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit or just being filled with the Holy Spirit, it is by this outpouring and the overflow that we are empowered for ministry. And we need this power. We need this power. And Jesus desires that we have it. God wants us to have this power. He wants us to be filled with the Spirit because then we cannot contain it inside of us. We have to tell the world about Jesus because the Holy Spirit always wants to point towards Christ to show and tell the world that they need a personal relationship with Jesus who can forgive their sins, who can wipe away their tears, who can, who can, who can take away their pain, who can fill the void in your heart so that they can follow Jesus and see exactly what he desires to do in their life and through their lives. This power in the Holy Spirit, if you're uncomfortable about talking about power so much, it is not just strength. It is referring to a power at work or in action. Luke shows us in his two books how the Spirit provides the power and the authority, authority, still growing up, to drive out demons, how the Spirit gives the anointing to heal, heal the sick. Oh, my goodness. Heal the sick. This is not the tongues that it's talking about when, uh, in Acts chapter 2. To drive out the demons and the anointing to heal the sick. These are the two essential signs accompanying the boldness of the message of God's kingdom. We need the dose of the ghost. Now now more than ever, when the gates of hell are trying to come against you, when they're trying to take everything from you, when they're trying to take your marriage from you, when they're trying to take your kids from you, when they're trying to encroach on the educational system that's going on in there, when they're filling up every political party and power that's in place, every office that has any type of authority, we need the Holy Spirit to come rushing in, the mighty rushing wind. The, the, The enemy is trying to take everything from you, to take your children from you, and we are at war. Not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. We need the Holy Spirit to come on us like never before so we can take it all back from or for the kingdom of God. We need the Spirit. We need His help. We need His strength. We need His courage. We need His boldness. We need Him to breathe out into us and show us how to stand up to the world, to show us what to say to the world, to show us how to point them to the cross. And tell them that there is so much more than the lives that they are currently dying in, not living in. Because without Jesus, you're just dying. It is the Holy Spirit that takes the seeds of a message spoken from a platform or an office cubicle, in the restroom, in the gym, whatever, in the grocery store. It is he plants the seeds and convicts the hearts of the listener. It has literally nothing to do with what I say. It has nothing to do with what my dad says or any other preacher that's on a stage or on YouTube or on TikTok. It is all about the Holy Spirit speaking through them and pulling at your heart because of what they are saying, because it is the Holy Spirit speaking through them. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts you to make you know, to show you that you need Jesus. And I love there's two wills. In verse eight, two wills. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. We are not called to stand by idle and watch people die and go to hell. And neither are we called to stand by and watch them go through hell and live through hell while they're still here on this earth. 
We are called to access the power of the Holy Spirit and to be witnesses with it. The power of the Holy Spirit will strengthen your relationship with Jesus. It makes his presence more real. It makes it more revealed to you. He increases the effectiveness of your testimony, of your story, and your witness when you go to speak to someone. And the more you respond to his voice in you, the more he will reveal to you about Jesus in order that you can reveal that to someone else. In order to have an effective ministry, we need the spirit. We need the gift of the ghost. We need the dose of the ghost. I'm going to say it enough until you remember it when you go out of here because it sounds silly and it rhymes, but we need it. We need the Holy Spirit. Ministry is not just this. It is not just standing up here and talking. It's not just sitting there and listening to me talk for an hour. You are called to minister anywhere anytime, to anyone, by appointment. How many times have you felt that tug or that, that call and that pull to go talk to someone? And how many times have you actually genuinely responded to it? And notice, again, it's been 40 days since the resurrection. 40 days. And Jesus never gave them the time frame. He just says, wait. And they return to Jerusalem, and then they have a discussion about who's going to replace Judas. And uh, if you guys can bring out my illustration, please. There is now 120 people in the upper room. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. There is power and there is purpose in community. Hebrews says that we should not give up meeting together as is the habit of some. And if you've been on Facebook for more than 10 minutes, you're going to see all these people now telling you all kinds of misleading facts about how you don't need to go to church, how church is fake, and it's evil, and you don't have to go. Yes, we are the church, and you don't need the church for Jesus. But the point of church is to come together and to love one another, to encourage one another, to spur one another to love and good works, to instruct and to honor one another. There is a reason for this. There is a reason for the church. There is something amazing about gathering together and worshiping and listening and hearing the word of God. I mean, you felt his presence this morning after we sang that song, while we were singing that song. And in verse 2, suddenly, everybody say suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. And now you're like, why is there a leaf blower on the stage? (laughs) Suddenly, a sound (laughs) like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting, not just a part of it not just one person, the whole house. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is now 10 days after Jesus ascended. You heard him mention the 50 days. That's where we get the term Pentecost. It's the Greek Greek name for the festival in the Old Testament known as the Feast of Weeks. The Greek word obviously meaning 50, referring to the 50 days that have elapsed since Passover. The Feast of Weeks celebrated the end of the grain harvest. And if you don't know what that means, it is when the first fruits of the harvest are offered to God. Oh, yeah. mm. Pentecost, Pentecost is like the Last Supper. Two different events, but in both events, all of the disciples are sitting in a room together just before a significant event. And the Last Supper, as we know, is just before the death of Jesus. And he tells them to remember him after his death until he returns. 
and Jesus dies on the day of Passover. And if you, if you don't know Passover, it originated in Egypt uh, when God was pulling them out with Moses. They had to sacrifice a lamb and, and use the lamb's blood over the door so that the angel of death, uh, this sounds crazy to anybody that <laughs> doesn't read the Bible, so the angel of death would pass over them and their uh, firstborn would not be killed, only the Egyptians, because God was judging the Egyptians. And they use it to celebrate and remember their redemption. They use Passover to celebrate and remember their redemption. And Jesus dies on Passover because he is our Passover lamb. He is the lamb that was slain for our sins so that we may be redeemed. So he dies at Passover, signaling the end of his earthly ministry. And now at Pentecost, they would be celebrating the first fruits. Passover is the end of Christ's earthly ministry, and Pentecost is signaling the beginning, the birth of his church. At Passover, the Son is betrayed, and at Pentecost, the Spirit is breathed out. The Son is betrayed, and now his Spirit is breathed out. It is poured out. The church began with Christ, but it still needs the Spirit to spread. And notice, nowhere in there were they sitting around in silence. And being idle. They were not like, hey, y'all want to, what do you want to do today? Where are we going to eat? What are we doing? You want to go to McDonald's? Where are we going for lunch? They were praying together. If you don't know what else to do in your season of waiting, the right choice is never going to be worrying while you're waiting. It is never going to be sitting around just waiting on God. It's not going to be Netflix. It's not going to be YouTube. It's not, it's not going to be Hulu. It's not going to be anything other than praying for his power over your problems. Be seeking his blood for your brokenness. To be seeking him to speak to your situation and to show up in your situation. If you're not sure what the next step is on your path, you cannot go wrong with praying. Because while you're praying, you're seeking God's guidance. And when you're seeking him, he is sending the word through the spirit to you, to your situation. God is patiently waiting on your prayers so he can fulfill them. And the Holy Spirit is there to speak through you when you don't know what to say or to pray. But verse two, suddenly. Did you, were you all here for anybody here for the team meeting? We already heard about suddenly. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Suddenly there is a sound. Their steady prayers brought a sudden surge of power. They were praying steady, and then God shows up suddenly. And in church, we always usually shout over this part, the sound like the rushing wind, but it is literally a violent wind. This is like a storm, like a hurricane. And I know in Florida, what we generally do with storms is just go sit on the front porch and watch them. But when you're going through a storm in your life, you're not shouting about it. Hopefully you're seeking God about it instead of just complaining about it, instead of just wallowing around in it. But this wind came from heaven with a purpose, with a power. And all of them, all of them, are filled with the Holy Spirit. He now fills and remains in them. He doesn't just come on them for a season, for a time. He stays in them to equip them for what they are called to do, to be witnesses. What used to be limited in the Old Testament is now everlasting. What used to be provisional for a certain people is now permanent. And we have access to this, where the Spirit used to only inhabit a person or a few at a time, he now indwells in them and he indwells in all of us. But the problem with the church in general is that we have stopped up the spirit and we haven't been seeking him to baptize us and to fill us up with an overflow that we can pour out onto other people. And they too can experience this. This is why we need to seek more of the spirit. We need the dose. You got it. You're going to remember it or you're going to hate me about it. 
We need him to equip us. We need him to further us. We need him to strengthen us. We need him to empower us. We need him to speak to us. We need him to reveal things to us. We need him to work through us. We need him to make us bolder. We need him to make us louder. We need him to make us stronger. We need him to make us braver. We need him to show us where to go, where to walk, what to do, how to seek God more. He makes the Bible come alive to you. We need more of the Holy Spirit. This should be such a burning desire in each of our hearts, in each of our lives, for every single Christian, because it is God's desire that you not just have the Spirit, but that you be filled and full of it. We got the Holy Spirit when we received Jesus, but there is so much more in store. He wants to fill us. He wants to pour out his spirit on us so that we can continue to spread his message. Now, we started in Acts 1. And when it ended, nothing had changed. There was no sound in Acts 1. Jesus has already gone from the situation. And they're just sitting around casting lots to see he will replace Judas, praying and seeking God. Nothing has changed at all. And in chapter 2, there is the rushing wind. The Spirit did not come silently. He came suddenly. He came swiftly. He came sounding like a storm. And he came to strengthen them for the next chapter. Maybe you're still in chapter one. And before I do this, this is not a Bible because I knew the internet would lose its mind if I did what I'm about to do with a Bible. Some of you are still here in the beginning and you're waiting on God to turn the page and you're reluctant to turn the page. Or maybe you're somewhere in the middle and you think it's the end but you're reaching the climax of a situation that you have no idea how it's going to turn out. And everything looks against you. Every, every good story has the beginning, the middle, and the end. And it's never good unless there's a problem to face and a problem to fix. And then when everything turns out good, if it's a good book and a good story, maybe you want to read it again. Maybe right now you're right here and you think you're back here. But God's like, no, you're really right here on the introduction page. And suddenly, God shows up in the middle of the story when nothing has changed, when nothing has ended, and there's a sound. Who's nervous? There is a sound like a mighty rushing wind, not rushing, rushing. Now, I originally wanted a battery-operated one, but, uh, you know, just like the wind came from heaven, this too needs a source to come from. So you need to be plugging into Jesus a little bit more, waiting on the sound of the mighty rushing wind. And it's a violent wind. And it sounds scary. And it sounds loud. And it can blow the house down. I thought about doing that to y'all, but y'all's hair's too pretty. So maybe you're distant from your story. And you're wondering, God, when are you going to show up? And chapter one has ended. And nothing has changed. And suddenly... God shows up to propel the story further and faster than you could imagine because when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your Christian walk and your Christian faith goes from baby steps to killing Goliath. And you grow immediately and you're wondering, God, when are you going to show up? And you're wondering when he's going to be in your story. And suddenly there is a violent wind and you're still stuck in the tension of chapter one. And suddenly, God turns the page. (laughs) 
your brokenness and your bitterness are back here in the beginning. Your pain is only in the prologue. And if you don't read any books, that's the intro. Your iniquity was just the introduction that you needed to know that you need a savior that can show up and save you from your sins, that he can sustain you in life. And suddenly God shows up with a mighty rushing wind to show you that your story is not over, to show you that there is the arrival of the anointing, to show you that there is the arrival of the Holy Spirit, to show you that there is the arrival of strength, to show you that there is the arrival of the pouring out, to show you that there is the arrival of the blessing, of the strength and the courage that God needs you to use to further his message. There is suffering back in chapter one. But the sound of the wind comes in, signaling the arrival of the assignment of the next chapter. And since the Savior provided the sacrifice, he's go- sacrifice, he's going to send his spirit to sustain your salvation, to sustain you for all that he is calling you to do, to further your faith, to help heal you, to help guide you, to strengthen you, to help you be brave, to help you be bold. He wants to send you a dose of the ghost. And it is the Holy Spirit that convicts us of our sins. It is the Holy Spirit that uses the seeds of a silly sermon or a crazy illustration to pull at your hearts. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts you. The world will tell you, that Christians condemn you, that church condemns you, the world will condemn you. God doesn't condemn you. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. None. You can be convicted and it doesn't feel good, but I promise you it is entirely better than the alternative. And today, I want to change it up a little bit and have two prayers. For those of you who have never received Jesus, never heard about Jesus, whether you're watching online sometime after the fact or you're here in this room now, I want us to corporately pray together for the salvation, to receive salvation. If the Holy Spirit right now is tugging on your heart and you could have heard something entirely different than I have even talked about for the last 50 minutes, because he'll do that. Maybe he's reading your mail and he is striking an arrow straight to your situation, showing you that you need Jesus. So if we can, together, every head bowed and every eye closed, if everybody can repeat after me, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son to die for my sins and to be resurrected so that I will never die. Jesus, I give my life to you. I make you my Lord and Savior. I will follow you the rest of my days. Amen. Hmm. It is not a magical prayer. It is an opportunity to confess what you believe in your heart, to apply the Bible to your life. And just as importantly as that is to choose and follow Jesus, I want to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I hesitate to say it, but a a, a second Pentecost, a double dose of the ghost. Because we need him. We need more of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that not only that I did you justice with the word that you gave me, but that you strike to their hearts, Lord. And I pray that your spirit descends on this place like a dove. Where two or three are gathered, you are there. And we know that you are there, that you are here. We know that the Holy Spirit is here. And I pray for each and every person in this room that they not just have received 
the Holy Spirit, but that they be filled with the Holy Spirit, that they be baptized by the fire, that they be refined, that they be sifted, God, each and every one of us, starting with me, God, that you descend and pour your spirit on us like never before, that you pour your spirit on us like has never been seen, God, that revival begins in this room, that resurrection begins in this room, that situations are not just turning around, they are being restored, being renewed, being healed, God, that your spirit pours out like we have never seen before, Lord, to equip us for what you have called us to do. So that we can spread your message, so that we can share your glory, so that we can share the message of Jesus, Lord. Pour your spirit out on us like never before. Fill this room, God. Fill this room, God. Holy Spirit, come. We need you. We need you. We need you. Let this be an upper room. Let this be an upper room. Let the spirit come like a dove. Let there be tongues of fire and all the gifts coming to pass, coming to the purpose of these people's lives. When they go out back to their jobs, back to their careers, back to their families, just out of this room, God, that your spirit is so thick on them that demons flee. God, let us begin to seek you more than the American church has in years. Let us begin to start casting out demons in Jesus' name, to perform miracles in Jesus' name, to see lives healed, to see broken bodies healed, to see miracles again, and to perform them in Jesus' name, God. I invite you to show up with miracles and signs following because we need you. The world needs you, God. Let revival begin. Amen. 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 They're going to play one more song so we can worship together. And I, I invite you, there will be people to pray with you up here. I know when the invitation happens, it's, it's, it's so often that people just want to immediately leave or when the lights go down, we want to leave. This is literally the most important part, I think, of the entire day. And people walk out on an invitation. She's not leaving. God's not walking out on you. Can I join you? Can I join you? Going to. <laughs> Pentecost, Pentecostal believers, spirit filled believers, those believers that you know what it means to pray in the Holy Spirit. You know what that heavenly language is. Y'all, y'all can nod your head. You know, you know who you are. Spirit filled believers. Would everyone in the building just stand with me for a second? Sometimes we can. Speaking for me, we can feel like a relic from days gone by. We can feel like a relic from days gone by to this new way of churching, the, the new upscale church, the new way they do church, the way it's so professional and the way it's so smooth. And there's never any, anything strange so that the people when they leave say, man, we've seen strange things today. You know who I'm talking about? Relics, dinosaurs. Y'all know what I'm talking about. While they worship, I'd like to invite, this is just burned in me while you were finishing, the, the, the born-again, spirit-filled believers that are in this room to find a place to pray. If y'all want to come to the altar, you're saved to the ghost, you're saved to the bone, you all. But I want to see some intercession done in the spirit this morning. Could we do that? That y'all, would you just come and find a place to pray and stir up the gift of God that is in you this morning. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in that heavenly language. It doesn't have to be up here. It could be in a corner. It could be in the back. But just even at your seat, if you just want to stir up the gift of God and pray in the Spirit this morning. I, y'all hear what I'm saying? We, we want to see revival. We want to see the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit in the world, in the church. I want it to start here. I... I, I I live with a spirit-filled woman who prays in the Holy Ghost all the time. I, I, I love the heavenly language. So this morning, while they, while they worship, while we sing that song, I just want to give you that opportunity to do that. Find a place to pray. 
fall on your face, get on your knees and just pray in the spirit. Because when you pray in the spirit, you're not praying with your understanding. You're praying in a language that only God can understand. And just stir that gift up and let that gift fill this room and let God just do whatever he wants to do with that. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.